Hello everybody, it's Jay Roby bringing you Game 9 of the World Chess Championships. Of course, current World Chess Champion Anand is defending against Topolov. We're all tied up at four points apiece with only four games remaining. And uh, Topolov has definitely had the momentum shift in his favor. He was able to draw against Anand with the white pieces two times. Uh, so Topolov playing with the black pieces achieved two draws in a row. Then he came back with the white pieces and he was able to beat Anand. So over the course of three chess games now, Topolov was able to stonewall Anand two times when Anand had the white pieces. He got the point... To even up the match. We've only got four games left, um, so we definitely have a World Chess Championship series going on, uh, which is awesome for chess fans everywhere. Um, so let's just dive right into it here. And Anne, of course, is under pressure. He wants to get his point back. He doesn't want to, uh, you know, draw or take a loss of the white pieces, that's for sure, especially after uh, drawing a couple times the Topolov already. Um, so Anand opens up with pawn to d4. And we should just start to call this uh, World Chess Championship series the d4 showdown in Sofia. That's what I'm thinking, uh, because that's pretty much what it's been so far. I don't know if these guys have something personal going on. On uh, behind the scenes, because they both seem to have their minds pretty set on uh, you know squaring off with the d4 opening. Um, so from here, Topolov plays knight up to f6, and the first couple moves are actually pretty similar to what we've seen before. But we are going to get into some deviation here. In fact, we're going to get into some Nimzo lines, uh, which is interesting. So totally different from previous games played in the past. Now, of course, this is uh, Topolov who's uh, initiating this. Now, from here, Topolov played his bishop up to b4. Of course, he's pinning that knight down to the king, and Anand continues now by pushing his pawn up to e3. Um, so these are all very much book moves. Uh, up to this point. Now pawn to e3 of course is opening up access for that light square bishop sitting on uh, f1 and from here Topolov continues now with an early castle and Anand plays bishop up now to d3. And I just want to take a quick moment and talk about this bishop to d3 move. Um, of course it is defending the pawn on c4 um, but in these lines uh, it's not uncommon at this high level of play uh, to sacrifice that bishop at some time in a dramatic and flashy fashion by taking that pawn on h7. Um, so we could be in for a wild chess game from this point. Uh, so from here Topolov continues by pushing his pawn up to c5. That's, of course, attacking the pawn on d4. And then develops his knight here. Knight's giving another defender to that square. And from here, Topolov pushes his other pawn up now to d5. So we definitely have some tension building up here along the c and d files. Uh, from this position now, Anan continues with the castle. And Topolov now takes on d4. So he's initiating some action in the center from which Anan now captures back with the pawn. So he connects the c pawn to the d pawn. And from here now, Topolov takes the pawn now on c4. And Anand recaptures with the bishop. Um, so white does have an ice Isolated pawn here, um, but uh, you know Topolov's going to have to work towards making that a weakness. Uh, so from this position now, Topolov continues now by pushing his pawn up now to b6. So he's getting ready to fianchetto that light square bishop, have it carved down along this light square diagonal, and from here Nan brings his bishop up now to g5. So it's pinning that knight down to the queen, and uh, Topolov continues now by fianchettoing that bishop, and Nan plays rook over to e1. So given his rook influence along the e file, uh, from here play continues now. Topolov brings his knight up to d7. So he's given this knight here on f6 another defender just in case Anand one, wants to trade it off and bring the queen out um, in some lines. Uh, so Topolov prevents that by placing his knight onto d7 and from here now Anand brings his uh, rook over to c1. And I'm going to apologize right now because I'm going to try to go through this game um, in a speedy fashion uh, because it is uh, it's quite a lengthy game and let's just put it this way. You can take the Ribka analysis from this game and probably draft a short story. Um, that's how uh, interesting and, uh, and crazy that this game is going to get. Uh, so from here now, um, Topolov brings his rook over to c8, so we're getting more influence down on the c file here from Topolov. He's also attacking the bishop here on c4. Um, so Nan brings that bishop back now to d3, and we always have to remember that in some of these lines, uh, there could be that flashy sacrifice here on h7. So play continues now. Topolov brings his rook over to e8, and Nan now brings his queen up to e2. So the queen and the rook, of course, are supporting each other. And the queen's also backing up this light square bishop along this light square diagonal. Um, so Nan could, if he wanted to, he could play his light square bishop up to a6. Uh, so from this position now, Topolov does capture that knight now on c3, and Nand recaptures with the pawn, and we have to remember now in the position that that pawn on c3 needs that rook on c1 for defense in the position as it currently stands. Um, so it could be something that Topolov might want to try to make use of uh, by building up pressure. Uh, so from here now, Topolov does put, place his queen on c7. This of course doesn't, you know, it adds pressure to the c3 square, but he isn't going to come in and capture it with his queen, uh, so no immediate danger there for Nand. Um, so Nand now continues now, uh, bishop back to h4. And the reason that Anand plays this is because he's not pinning that knight down to anything anymore. Uh, so the knight on f6 you know, can move at will because that dark square bishop isn't attacking anything on d8. And he's also preparing to bring that to g3, which would be attacking that queen on c7. Um, so Anand is kind of restructuring his pieces. So from here play continues. Now Topolov swings his knight to h5. Now that of course is eyeballing up the f4 square from which now Anand plays knight up to g5. So we have two attackers now on that pawn on h7. Topolov responds by pushing 
his g pawn up. So that's basically blunting that uh, light square bishop sitting on d3. So any kind of sacrifice is currently taken away from the position. And of course, the side benefit of pawn to g6 at this knight on h5 is also defended now because when Anand swung his knight up to g5, landing two attackers here on h7, he also um, opened up access for his queen to attack that knight on h5, which didn't have a defender. Uh, so Toplas pawn move is doing a couple things in the position. Uh, so from here, Anand swings his knight down to h3. Of course, this is helping to defend the f4 square. And because Toplov doesn't have to face a bishop sitting on g3 quite yet, he's able to push his pawn up now and make a play for the center by pushing his pawn up to e5. From here, Anand responds to that by pushing his own pawn up to f3. And this move is doing a couple things for Anand. Of course, it's blocking the uh, influence of this light square bishop here on b7. Um, so we've got good control of uh, the e4 square in this position. But it's also opening up access for his dark square bishop to come to f2 to help give more firepower here to the d4 square. Uh, so it's an interesting move here from Anand. Uh, from here, Toplov continues by bringing more pressure now to the d4 square. He plays his queen to d6, so that's bearing right down on d4. And Anand continues now with bishop to f2, so giving more firepower to that uh, d4 square. And from here now, um, Toplov captures, so he's uh, initiating some action in the center. Now, we have to uh, kind of just stop here for a, a second or two and, and take a look at the position because there's a few interesting things going on. Of course, Toplov has just gained a pawn here by capturing on d4, and then is going to get it back. But the question is, how is he going to do that? Because we have that rook sitting on e8, bearing down on our, on Anand's queen sitting on e2. Um, and Anand actually elects to trade his queen off uh, for two rooks. So he captures on e8 with check. Toplov recaptures. Anand hits a check again. From here, Toplov swings his knight to uh, f8. And basically what we have is we're going to have a, a very sharp tactical game moving forward from this point. Anand is playing with two rooks for the queen. And, um, you know, if you're familiar with Grandmaster games, you'll see this crop up on occasion. I'm not going to say it's a common uh, thing to trade two rooks for a queen. You don't see it that often. But there are, you know, there are quite a few Grandmaster games where you will see the Grandmaster trade off uh, the queen for two of his opponent's rooks. And, uh, you know, in terms of material count, a rook is worth five pieces on its own. Um, so you do get ten points of material um, in return for the queen, which is rated at about nine points of material. Um, but it's, n it's not going to be an easy position to play from uh, because when you're playing with two rooks against a queen especially when you've got a bishop left on the table you always have to be very careful that you don't skewer the rooks. Um, you also have to be careful that you don't put your king on a square that it can be checked um, at the same time from the checking piece can be attacking an undefended rook. Um, so it's definitely going to be some interesting chess moving on from this point um, so we definitely have some uh, some fireworks taking place in the position. Uh, now from this position after Toplos swings his knight back to f8 and then now captures that pawn back on d4 and he does so in such a way that the dark square bishop, of course, on f2 is still defending the pawn. Um, and, of course, the pawn is now passed. So he's taken his pawn off of the c file. And, of course, Toplov still has his a and b pawns. Um, so he's created a pass pawn for himself along the d file. Now, of course, Toplov's probably going to try to target that as much as possible. Um, but I thought it was a pretty good move from an end in the position. And at the same time, he's also opening up access for his c rook sitting on c1. Um, so we're definitely into some interesting chess here. Uh, so from this position, Toplov continues swinging his knight up to f6. So he's getting that knight off of the rim of the board, getting into a more active position. He's also attacking the rook in the process. And from here, and then pulls his rook back now to e1. So we have the rooks connected again. And uh, we're going to have a fighting game from this point. Uh, so from this position now, Toplop brings his other knight now to uh, e6. So he's attacking the pawn on d4. We have two attackers there. And Anand plays bishop up now to c4. So he's attacking the knight now on e6. Uh, from here, play continues. Bishop to d5. Now I just want to go back one quick move here. Um, that pawn actually still can't be taken in this position. For example, if Toplop came in and captured that pawn, all Anand would have to do would be to slide a rook over it here to the d file, and um, black is going to go down a lot of material because he has to sack that knight. So instead, in the position, if we go back, uh, Toplov elects to play bishop now to uh, d5. So he's attacking the light square bishop here on c4, and as reply to this is to bring his dark square bishop up now to g3 because this uh, d4 pawn is no longer under attack by the queen and the knight together, and he's also attacking the queen. Um, so Toplov has to do something about his queen before he can even think about capturing here on d4. Uh, so Toplov swings his queen now to b4, giving it an active position still. Of course, it's still attacking this light square bishop here on c4. And from here now, Anand pushes his bishop up now to uh, e5, attacking the undefended knight. Now, if we go back a move, let's say uh, Anand would have tried to just capture the bishop outright. Uh, well, this doesn't work out too good for him because uh, Toplov can come in, hit that pawn now on d4, and he does so with check. Um, so Anand has to move the king off or play a piece out. And uh, it doesn't really matter what Anand plays in that position because the bishop's then going to fall and uh, Toplov is going to be uh, fine in terms of material. And Anand 
Anne loses that nice pass pawn. Um, so definitely not uh, something that uh, Anand wanted to play in the position. So instead of doing that, of course, um, Anand elected for bishop up now to e5, attacking the undefended knight. Now from here, uh, Topolov swings his knight to d7, so he's attacking the dark square bishop, and Anand plays now pawn up to a3, so he's attacking the queen. And facing this, Topolov decided to push his queen over to a4, so it's still giving an attacking capabilities to the c4 square. It's also keeping an eye on that a3 pawn in case he wants to uh, take it in the future. But I want to go back and move again. And um, what would happen if he would have captured the pawn? Unfortunately, it doesn't work out very good for black because if black takes that pawn, this lets white come in now and snag up that bishop. Of course, black has to reply, so he'll capture the bishop here on e5. White will recapture with the pawn, and the resulting moves really favor white in the position because the way that the pieces are lined up, um, the attack just comes to black, and there's nothing that black is going to be able to do to stop it from losing a little bit of material. And of course, white's going to have a really nice position here uh, because his play continues. Um, you know, white's just a lot more coordinated, and I think in terms of material, white would be up by um, well, probably three pawns, just eyeballing it up here. So definitely not uh, worth taking that pawn at this uh, particular juncture in the game, given the way that the pieces are lined up. Uh, so Topolov, of course, doesn't do that. Uh, he plays his queen over to a4, like we talked about, and from here now, and then does capture that bishop on d5. Topolov retakes with the dark square bishop here on uh, e5, or sorry, he takes the dark square bishop on e5, and then recaptures by taking the knight on e6, and now Topolov takes that pawn now on d4 with check. The king peels off, and from here now, the light square bishop is captured on e6. So we definitely have some fireworks going on in the position, and things aren't looking too bad for white at all, actually, because white, of course, has its nice knight on h3 that it can jump into the action relatively quickly, attacking that pawn on e6. And, of course, white just has, uh, you know, a few more pieces to work with. Anand has uh, got this two rooks and a knight, and, of course, uh, Topolov has one queen and one knight. Um, so it's definitely going to be an interesting game moving forward from this point. Um, but I think that white is standing just a slight little bit better in this position. Uh, so from here now, play continues. Anand does jump that knight up now to g5, so he is attacking that pawn now on e6. Topolov has to do something about that, so he plays his queen back now to d6 to give that pawn a defender. And Anand jumps his knight now to uh, e4, so he's attacking the queen, also giving some good jump points for his knight uh, for possible use in the future. Um, but I want to go back and move here. Anand had an interesting try here by just taking the pawn outright on e6. And uh, the best uh, move that black could counter with in this position uh, would be queen takes pawn here on e3. Uh, because unfortunately for black, the knight can't be taken. If the knight's taken in this position, um, basically all Anand has to do is push up his pawn to f4, and the play that results just gives white a pass pawn on the e-file. And with the two rooks, it's going to be a very difficult position for uh, black to defend. Um, so that definitely wasn't an option um, for black to uh, take the knight. So Nan could have tried that. Could have tried to take here with uh, the knight on e6, uh, but he elected for uh, knight to uh, e4 instead, um, which maybe was a safer move in the position. It's tough to say. Uh, but from here now, play continues. Topolov does snag up the pawn now on a3. So he is temporarily up a pawn, but of course that's not going to last long in the position because the Nan has a couple of things working in his favor. Namely, of course, he's got the two rooks still, a nice knight perched here on e4, and uh, the h7 and a7 pawns are quite weak. So Anand's definitely going to press for that advantage. Uh, from here now, Anand attacks a queen on c3. The queen falls back to b2, keeping an eye on the rook. And from here, Anand plays a pawn up down to uh, h4. And this is basically giving in his king an escape square here on h2, so he doesn't have to worry about back row mates in the future. And it's also starting to bring his pawns closer up to the uh, enemy king. Uh, from here, Topolov continues by pushing his own pawn up now to b5. So trying to mobilize his pawns, bring them closer to the promotion squares. And from here now, Anand hits a check on c8. King falls back now to g7, and Anand hits a check again. And uh, when the king goes now to uh, f8, there goes uh, the knight here to uh, g5. So we can see here how Anand is going to get his material back, because uh, he's got two attackers now on the h7 square. So not even the king can stop this pawn from falling. And of course, the a7 uh, pawn is being attacked as well. And if that wasn't enough, of course, the knight sitting on g5 is also attacking the pawn on e6. So like, I mean, Anand is definitely going to get the material back in this position. Uh, so Topla plays his king over to e8, and uh, Anand comes in now with the rook, takes the pawn on h7, and from here Topolov attacks the rook on e1 by bringing his queen now to uh, c3, but Anand doesn't worry about that right away. Instead, he hits a check with the rook here on h8, forcing the king off of uh, the e8 square. Topolov plays his king up to d7, and now Anand checks again uh, by hitting it uh, with the rook on h7. King peels off now to c6, and from here Anand lifts his rook up now to uh, e4. Um, so now the pawn to h4 move uh, should make even mu that much more sense. Because of that, his king can access uh, the h2 square, and he was able to lift that rook up to uh, e4 and not worry about any kind of back row mates in the position.
So definitely forward thinking from Anand. And we have to remember again that, you know, Anand has a slight advantage in this position because, you know, while the queen is almost worth as much as two rooks, technically speaking, um, the queen is still only one piece. Uh, so in this open position, Anand has two rooks that he can uh, bring into the action, plus, of course, his knight. Um, so it's definitely not an easy position for Topolov to play. So from here, he continues pushing his pawn up to b4. And you might be wondering, well, what about the, the pawn here on e6? Well, unfortunately for Topolov, he's got a lot of pawns that are uh, under attack in the position. For example, um, instead of pushing his pawn to b4, which is trying to bring that pawn uh, closer to the promotion square, if he would have tried to protect the pawn on e6, well, of course, the pawn on a7 just falls. Um, so he's going to go down a pawn anyway. Uh, so facing the position, uh, he decides to bring his pawn closer to the promotion square, pushing it to b4, from which Anand now snags up the pawn on e6. Uh, now Toplop replies by bringing his king over to b6, so it's defending the pawn on a7. And from here now, Anand jumps his knight to the f4 square. So he's threatening, of course, hitting the d5 square, which would fork the king and the queen. Um, so Toplop definitely has to do something about that. He hits a check on a1, and when the king peels to h2, Toplop pushes his pawn up now to uh, a5. So the pawn's no longer under attack here on a7, and of course it's protecting uh, the b4 pawn. Um, so, you know, there are some positional trumps for both players uh, in the game so far. It's pretty much uh, an equal position. Uh, so from this position now, Anand plays his pawn up now to h5, and the general goal of Anand here is he wants to create some pass pawns for himself. Um, from here, of course, Toplov pretty much has to capture. He doesn't want to let the pawn take here on g6, and uh, from this position now, Anand takes that pawn back on h5, so he's attacking the knight on e5. Um, Toplov has to do something about that, plays his knight over to c6, and now Anand jumps his knight into d5, hitting the check. Um, Toplov places his king now onto b7, and Anand hits a check again on h7. King goes now to uh, a6, and now Toplov brings his rook up to uh, e6, uh, pinning the knight down to the king. And, you know, it looks really dangerous in this position uh, for Toplov. You know, like, I mean, these rooks are very active. They're all, all over him on his side of the board. Um, so he definitely has to do something in the position. Uh, he plays his king over now to uh, b5, which is pretty much the only square that he can uh, play it to and still defend that knight. And from here now, Anand pushes his rook down to h5. Um, so he's getting ready to lift his knight off of d5 and hit with check at the same time uh, in the process of doing so. Uh, so from here, Toplov continues now knight down to d4. Of course, he's attacking the rook uh, here on e6, uh, but Anand doesn't have to worry about that right away. He just jumps his knight up now to b6 because the knight's defended by the rook. And of course, this rook on h5 is the one that's delivering check. Uh, so from here, Toplov has to play his king. He plays it back to a6. And from here now, Anand attacks Toplov's knight uh, on the d file. And of course, still maintaining that pressure on the king because the knight on uh, b6 uh, can jump at any time. And when that happens, uh, Toplov's going to get hit with check. Um, now, of course, the knight is being defended by the queen. So it's not, uh, you know, not totally dangerous for Toplov yet. Uh, so Toplov elects to play his king up to b7 in this position. And now Anand jumps his knight down now to uh, c4. So he's attacking the pawn here on a5 uh, with two pieces. We've got the rook and the knight. Uh, so Toplov has to do something about that in return. Um, he hits a check now on uh, f3. And I think at this point in the game, uh, Toplov realized that he wasn't going to be able to get the win in this position. So he had to fight for the draw. And I think that what he wants to do here is he wants to expose Anand's king. He wants to remove all those pieces that are around Anand's king uh, so that he can start to hit a gratuitous amount of checks and uh, maybe try to get a draw through repetition. Um, because these rooks that White has are so dangerous in the position. Um, and of course, White still has the knight as well. Um, so definitely a lot of fireworks going on here. So from this position, of course, under check, Anand does take that knight now on f3. And uh, his king is a bit more exposed. Uh, but the question is, is that going to be enough uh, for Toplov to hold a position? Uh, from here, he does hit the check on uh, a2 now. Of course, that's attacking uh, the knight there on uh, c4. Uh, so Anand has to use that knight to block the check, brings the knight down to uh, uh, d2. And from here, Toplov attacks the rook now on uh, uh, c7. He's attacking the rook on d6. And I'm just going to flip through the next couple moves, because basically what Anand does is he just hits a series of checks with the rooks. Um, he was under time pressure, um, so he made these moves pretty quickly. And uh, Toplov just keeps bringing his pawns down closer towards promotion. Uh, but this king is so exposed in this position, uh, it's just crazy. And even though there are a couple things in the position, like the A and B pawns being so close to promotion, that make it seem like Toplov might be able to pull something off here, uh, Black is just in a hopelessly lost position with that exposed king. 
But luckily for Topolov, Anand couldn't find the winning combination. Um, and we're just going to flip through what was played in the game because it's quite a few moves. But basically, Anand plays his king up to g3. And from here, um, Topolov plays a series of moves that actually do allow him to get two queens onto the table. So take a look at this position. We've got a queen on a1 and b1. Uh, so uh, Anand has to take off that uh, queen on b1 with his knight. Uh, Topolov recaptures with his queen. Uh, the game continues on a little bit farther. But basically, what we end up getting to is a point where... Um, uh, uh, Topolov just hits a series of checks over and over and over again, and the game ends in a draw. Um, so Topolov's knight sack uh, helped him, but it wasn't enough. If we go back to um, this position here, where Anand played uh, king to g3, um, there was a winning line that he could have tried instead. So I'm just going to flip back one move, and it was rook to d7. Now, in all fairness to Anand, though, this line is long. Like, I mean, the win doesn't come for a long time. I'm just going to flip through it so you can see the amount of moves that it takes uh, for the rook to d7 idea to actually generate a win for white. Um, so, you know, like I said, in all fairness to Anand, um, not being able to see that far ahead in the position um, isn't really surprising. Like, I mean, he's not a computer. You know, he doesn't have the Ribka 3 ability innately built into his uh, into his system. Um, and just take a look at how long this is taking. Uh, but nonetheless, it was there. Um, he could have uh, had the win if he would have found that uh, rook to d7 because he can get the queen off the table. Um, he ends up with a rook and a knight against uh, one. You know, it's just hopelessly lost for black. Uh, but that is a lot of moves. Like, I mean, and like I said at the beginning of the video, if you were to uh, take this game through Ribka, like I said, you could write a virtual short story on all of the different lines that you see. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, all, you know, Ribka aside, the game ends in a draw, and Anand is not able to defeat Topolov uh, with the white piece is in game 9. Uh, so that means that going into game 10, uh, we're still tied. Now it's four and a half points each, and uh, the winner of the World Chess Championship is only two points back. That means that either one of these players, either Anand or Topolov, uh, can score one win and draw the last two games and uh, become the World Chess Champion. And of course, we have to remember out of the last three games, Topolov has the white pieces two times. Um, so not only does he have momentum, he got a little bit lucky in this game. Uh, he was in a losing position, but he did get lucky. He got the draw. Now he gets the white pieces two more times out of the remaining three games. Uh, so the next game, game 10, he'll have the white pieces. Anand gets the black pieces in game 11. And Topolov gets the white pieces in game 12. Um, so if Topolov has ever had a shot um, at winning this match, he's got it now. Because he's definitely got uh, the momentum. And he's got two more games with the white pieces to Anand's one. Um, so it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens. So take care. Hope you enjoy the video. And We'll see you for game 10.